Uh, I just kept my uh, mask because it's an adv advertisement to the place where I'm here now, uh, because I'm uh, the director of a French lab, French Senderous lab, inside uh, uh, a foreign country, which is Canada. And uh, if uh, I would be correct, it would be to say if it's in Quebec. And uh, the CNRS has plenty of labs in every uh, field all over the globe. And uh, every uh, French researcher which is in the uh, Ministry of uh, Superior Education can apply for a position of six months, one year, or more in any other institute to uh, work with colleagues abroad. And uh, the CRM is uh, one of them. It's a center which is uh, 50 years old and which organizes thematic semesters on every field in pure, mostly, and apply mathematics. And uh, it's also a lab where uh, very, uh, the, uh, Joshua Benjo, who got uh, the Turing Prize, is at the head of Mila. And so, uh, my uh, talk of today, I decided, even if I have uh, slides, to present on board because I think that for, for a workshop, it's important that uh, you can follow at the speed at which I write and not at the speed at which I can uh, go through slides. So the two models, the first one, uh, I, I will be uh, quite uh, dubious on the presentation because it's works I've done uh, 20 years ago. So add to refresh my memory on all the proofs. Uh, so to, to tell you that it's uh, normal to forget when you do something. And that's very common when you look at a paper that you wrote. Oh, how did I prove that? And why this is true anymore? And so, uh, and the second one is an ongoing project. Uh, the two projects are linked with things I've done when I was at the French Atomic Energy Commission. The first one was a problem of porous media, and the porous medium problem for the CEA is important because uh, you have to deal with the fact of uh, nuclear waste. And if you want to put nuclear waste in a safe place, you have to know if in the next 100,000 years, there might be some water coming into the concrete and so damaging the uh, thing which is uh, around the nuclear waste. So you have to look at the exact behavior of porous media uh, in, uh, in, uh, in any constraint. So that was the thing where, uh, which led me first to understand that rather than having extremely precise codes for solving ex extremely precise problems. When we are on a multiphysics problem, it's very hard to couple the codes themselves because you have sometimes some uh, enhancement of properties given by the coupling of the models uh, because, of, uh, because you have uh, more richness of the global model than an each model. And the first of one will be on porous media. Uh, when you know that a porous media, it's a, a parabolic degenerate problem because when the medium is full of water, uh, the uh, quantity of water in the medium doesn't grow anymore. So that means that the uh, PDE that is considered for this problem will be degenerate in the uh, time uh, term. So that is the first problem. And the second problem is a problem which is an ongoing project with many colleagues, uh, including Stéphane Delacherie, with whom I worked with that uh, from 10 years ago about uh, for coupling the neutronics equation for computing the density of neutron inside a nuclear core and the thermohydraulic equations. And uh, you will see a very funny uh, cartoon I will uh, draw on the board for how things are were done till five years ago. So I began that with uh, Stéphane Delacherie, uh, then with uh, Erel Jamelot, and now with François Madio, uh, who is here, uh, with uh, um, François Dubois at Le CNAM, who was at Montréal this year 
and we worked on this project. And uh, numerous students, uh, among them uh, Riaz Muhammad, Abdel Koudous Moussa, and, the, uh, uh, and uh, this year Martin Duguay. Uh, two of them were from uh, uh, the engineering school in Ma Applied Maths of Paris 13, La Max. And the, the last one was in Central Casablanca. That's where I met with them. So let's go to um, uh, mathematics and problems. So the first equation will be the porous media equation. So we have two laws to give to take into account. We have a very famous Darcy law, which is also called sometimes Fick's law. And that gives the velocity of a fluid, sorry, uh, inside a porous medium, which is a quantity, which is the porosity omega. of the medium in fact it's a, uh, it's the volume of the empty pores divided by the total volume and omega times coefficients that i will write under this form only e is the height of the column of water uh, mu is the viscosity and of course, it's generated by the second equation of the earlier equations, where H is the height, equivalent height of water, and Z is the altitude. And so this law, it's written as a function K star, which depends on omega, which is uh, the porosity, as I said, the pressure of water times a uh, gradient of H, where H is the height of water. So that's the first equation. The second equation now is the equation which gives the conservation of the mass. And it writes dt of rho theta plus divergence of rho u is equal to, uh, let's say, minus rho q, where q is the inflow of water. Uh, theta is the quantity of water which is in the porous medium, which is closely related to omega. It's essentially uh, theta v is equal to v minus omega v. That means that uh, uh, you can either count the empty pores or the full pores. So that's uh, exactly similar. And this equation leads, finally, I do not do all the calculations to prove that, to the equation dt of theta is equal to divergence of k, which is a slight modification of k star of theta. Uh, gradient of h, essentially. And generally, we write instead of k of theta as omega is related to theta and p is related to h. We just write simply uh, divergence of k of h grad h. So here is a parabolic equation that you can look at and solve. And of course, you see very quickly that when the medium is full of water, that means that the empty pores are all uh, filled with water, this is zero. And so this parabolic equation degenerates into this elliptic equation. So how can we deal with something which is propagating in time? We cannot under this. So to do, the, uh, to do that, we have a, a result that was proved, proven uh, 20 years ago. It's a paper that uh, we published with Christophe Le Potier in 2001. And the proposition is the fo following. 
So I do, take this equation. I assume that theta has a function of h. And uh, this function of h is not a one-to-one -one function. So that is exactly the problem. So we assume, of course, on a, very, uh, on a toy model uh, that h of 0 t is equal to a, an initial value of the quantity of water global in the system. We assume that we want to solve this equation with a boundary condition h of 0 t is equal to h0, h of uh, 1 t is equal to h1. So the model, it will be for x in one dimension in 0, 1. Uh, remember that if you do not understand the things when the dimension d is 1, there is little hope to understand things when the dimension d is greater than 1. So we always do things with ODEs uh, or a PD, uh, of PDEs with only t and x as in one dimension uh, because it's the first insight of the problem and the properties of the problem. And if we do not understand that, we cannot go any further. And each time we want to run a numerical code with that, we have no uh, way of seeing if this numerical code, which gives something because a numerical code is a system of uh, a linear system. In fact, if this numerical code gives something, we do not know if this, relate, this is related to the solution of the problem. We have good hopes very often, of course, but uh, we have not a way of exactly seeing that. So with that, and the properties, of course, because uh, we want to have uh, something which is current at the beginning. So that means we don't want to have a jump at, as soon as t is strictly positive. We impose that these are the boundary conditions we impose on the solution of our problem in x directly boundary condition, in homogeneous directly boundary condition, and we want the initial datum to satisfy this directly boundary condition. So here is uh, the, the presentation, and the theorem which was proven was there resists a unique H such that H is in the space W1 infinity of 0, 1, with values in L1 of 0, 1. Uh, so, enter, sorry. So that means it's for each t we have this almost surely. So that is a proposition uh, that we sold uh, 20 years ago. Okay, you adapt. And I will only give uh, three things. First of all, uh, what is the form of theta? Because uh, when you deal with a model, we have to know what is theta. Uh, so we have a certain number of flows. So of course, we normalize theta by saying that theta cannot go under a certain value, which is called theta residual, as uh, this is written here and cannot go up, um, lar uh, cannot be larger than the saturated theta. So for the moment, uh, let's note that I'm staying with only the porous media equation. The last sentence will not be true anymore. And so sorry, uh, this is not a large theta, it's a small theta. And here, it's a large theta. So the small theta, theta is the one which is in the proposition, and the large theta is a, is a reduced one in zero one, of course. And the laws can be ln of large theta is equal to a plus b ln psi. And so, of course, I have to say what is psi. psi is the pressure of air minus the pressure of water. 
So that is the way water is pushing onto the material, and this is uh, Archimedes' law, in fact. Uh, the second law is theta is equal to a power of a value of psi at a power lambda. So this is a law, this one was introduced in 1983. This one is in 1964. And the last one is a one plus alpha psi at the power n, at the power minus m. And this one is from 1980. And uh, I will give the names because you may encounter them, Williams, Brooks, and Van Genuchen. And which is linked with uh, the uncertainty questions as the following. Uh, you see appearing many constants, A, B, lambda, psi E, A, alpha, N, M. And uh, in fact, uh, there are no proofs of these laws. So they are phenomenological laws. And so uh, these phenomenological laws come with an, uh, a mean value, an, an expectancy, and a law for N, M, N in uh, probabilities. And so when you want to use these laws, you have to remember that uh, numbers n and m are not fixed. And uh, you have to have something which is robust with a small variation of n and m, or which would be much better, an analytic formula for a solution with n, m, alpha, or lambda and psi a, and so on. And once you have an analytic formula, that will lead to one of my comments about uh, uh, one of the works I've done in the second model. Uh, you can perform a sensitivity analysis if you have analytic formulae. And of course, you have much more analytic formulae in the case of a 1D in space model. That means going to an ODE rather than going to a PDE. And so uh, that's another reason why I advocate the use of ODEs and 1D model at first to understand the uh, use of parameters. So uh, if someone is interested, I can Olivier? show. Oui? Yeah. Yes, uh, it's just a question out of curiosity. Do you have some uh, time regularity results on H? Uh, the time regularity is considered as C1. Uh, it can be improved to W1 infinity as well. So that means you can have dt theta in L infinity, but in general, it's a, a classical solution. Once you prove that it's a weak solution, you prove that it's a classical solution. So uh, maybe I can, I can uh, thank Virginie for the introduction, <laughs> for, the, uh, for the next thing that I want to say. So I was saying that for this, for that model, for example, uh, a PhD student of mine, uh, Cécile Baudry, 20, 15 years ago, uh, had some uh, analytic solutions of this equation using that. And so that could be used for the, for the, uh, for the sensitivity analysis. I don't know if it has been done, but that could be a nice thing to do. But as a question of Virginie can lead me to, uh, I can introduce an operator. And which is surprising, it's a not an one, a one to one operator. So it's a set of u such that u is equal to theta of h0 of x plus v of x. I should be rigorous and say for all x in 0, 1, u of x is equal to theta of h0 of x plus v of x. h0 of x, as everyone can guess, is h0 minus h1 minus h0 x. That means the solution which would be the simplest one which satisfies the uh, inhomogeneous boundary conditions. 
And of course, because it's much safer to deal with uh, homogeneous bound uh, directly boundary transition, we subtract to any solution of our problem this H0, so that V satisfies uh, zero directly boundary conditions because it's always safer not to be able to deal with boundary conditions. So, uh, with this U of X, of course, that tells nothing. I have to say, what is V? And in fact, uh, it's a F, rather precise, such that a resistor, uh, uh, not a unique, uh, sorry, sorry, a U, such that, uh, in fact, the value of this is, uh, so I will introduce this notation and explain it afterwards, uh, minus D over DX of K of H0 of X, is equal to f. So that means that uh, when I consider all the v uh, which are with a zero directly boundary condition and when I describe all the sets of these values of uh, depending on v, from this v I compute u by this formula and I consider the space of all these quantities f as being the set A of u. A of u, that's because I put brackets, it's a set. So it's a non-uniqueness of the problem which is uh, shown in clear light here. And of course, f is a function such that f prime of h is equal to k of h. Because you know, the uh, simple thing, simplest things which can occur when you deal with uh, an elliptic problem in 1D is that all elliptic problem in 1D up to a composition, it's a second derivative of a function. So every elliptic problem in 1D is the classical operator d minus d square of d dx square. Up this modification. And so the result is the following. In fact, we show that A is an accretive operator. Uh, so the, uh, the details of the proof are long, but I will give you the idea. I fix epsilon strictly positive. I construct, I construct U epsilon N of X is equal to I plus epsilon A minus N of theta i of x, of course, theta i of a, it's theta of h a, the initial datum. So now, as a is an accretive operator, when epsilon is strictly positive, this operator is a, a bijective operator, so you can inverse it, invert it and solve this. Okay, so now we suppressed the fact that you have infinitely many values in A of U in, in, into the fact that there is only one solution of this problem when you add one over epsilon i, in fact, to the operator A. Uh, accretive, that means it's monotonous. When you add one over, one over epsilon i to this operator, that gives an operator which is the uh, usual cursive one that you can invert with no, no trouble, no problem. And so from this, series of functions, you construct a time-dependent function u n of x, which is equal to u 1 over n k of x plus n t uh, minus k, if I do not do any mistake, u 1 over n k plus 1 of x, in fact, you construct a piecewise linear in time solution. Um, there might be a 1 over n over z. A piecewise linear, so I think it's that. A piecewise linear solution of the problem. Uh, no, uh, this is u, uh, un of x and t is equal to un uh, of x k over n, sorry, 
plus something which will give you the derivative, which is here, that you just constructed. So, in fact, this procedure constructs you on a grid the values of the derivative. So, this is u1 over n1, u1 over n2, and so on. This is the time steps. You construct a piecewise linear in time solution of the problem, which will be a solution in xt. And from the result, uh, result of Benny line with bold, you show that this uh, sequence here uh, converges uniformly on the one uh, for almost every t. Uh, and so that gives you a solution of the problem dealing with u, with this u there. So that is the first step. The second step of this procedure is just uh, once you have u, in fact, uh, you can compute u prime, and u prime, which is dTu, it's given by the sequence. So this is dTu. And now, if you take f is equal to dTu, where u is a uniform limit of un, and dTu is, com is computed almost so here, f is in infi L infinity, inter L1. And now, when you look at this problem here, once, once you give yourself f equal to dTu, this problem is an elliptic problem because large f is elliptic because large f uh, uh, is such that f prime of h is equal to k of h, and I assume, of course, in the Darcy law that k of h is strictly greater than a constant strictly positive, I get a unique v. If I get a unique v, I get a unique theta of h0 of x plus v, and the v, or rather the h0 of x plus v of x, t, almost everywhere, will be a, a function which is well defined, so uniqueness. And uniqueness, and now if you look at the equation, uh, sorry, it's, it's minus f is equal to dTu, otherwise it doesn't work. The u is theta of v plus h0, and you have a unique solution under this procedure of the uh, degenerate parabolic equation, which is right here. The equation is there. And so this procedure, through classical uniqueness of solution and uniform limit for a sequence of accurative operator, give you a unique solution for this degenerate parabolic equation. And once you have a unique solution of, a uh, of this equation, this procedure constructed, constructed numerically a unique solution of the, the unique solution of the problem. And so that means that in this case, the code gives you, with a very tricky way, a unique solution. But the story doesn't stop here for this problem. In fact, for this problem, uh, I will go much higher for the board. I observe, nevertheless, that uh, this problem is quite a, 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 a tricky problem and a tricky way to treat the porous media. Of course, you take into account the, the, uh, the behavior of the medium, but uh, it's quite hard and uh, rather weak as a solution. Oh, sorry, I will write it again. But there is a phenomenon uh, which was induced by numerical observation of Christophe Le Potier. Uh, that is a very interesting. In fact, when you want to solve this problem numerically, so I, uh, I erase the equation, but you remember it. In fact, you discretize in time. And of course, uh, you have a problem. Uh, in, two in the two cases, either you do an uh, explicit layer or implicit layer. If you do an explicit layer that explodes quickly because uh, the operator on the right-hand side is 
positive. And if you do an implicit Euler, then the Newton argument to solve the implicit Euler is degenerate as well. Uh, uh, you cannot, uh, there is no free lunch in this story. And so Christophe Lepotier uh, did something which was natural from a numerical point of view, adding a pseudo viscosity in the problem. So the term pseudo viscosity, normally if I say so, uh, this in a room, uh, people from uh, uh, CEA in applied math just uh, <laughs> raise the eyes because that's uh, the tricks which are used either at DAM, DEN, and uh, every place where you do apply math, uh, from Lascaux and Theodore uh, in the problem. But he explained to me something which was very interesting and very profound. He told me, but this uh, pseudo viscosity is natural because, in fact, you know, when you put water in a medium, uh, uh, a sponge in, uh, grows in size. So that means that there is an interaction, a uh, mechanical interaction between the equation of the porous medium and the medium itself. So you have to couple the Darcy law and the porous media equation. So I give back this as the equation, k the h, for example, you have to couple that with the mechanical behavior of the medium. And so a medium is never totally saturated. That means if it has room to uh, uh, enlarge, it will do. And so that's the thing I want to describe quickly. In fact, uh, we will use the following equations. So we have a, a first equation, which is the fact that the, LS, the uh, constraint tensor sigma IG is, of course, given by the classical law of uh, media uh, with a G, which is a matrix uh, alpha uh, and beta, which are constants, with epsilon, the displacement. This is the same epsilon, sorry. Uh, you have this behavior of the uh, mechanical constraints. And so that leads to an equation which will be for the porosity, which is a part of the medium, dt omega is one third of the divergence of a, a diffusion matrix dt sigma a minus a constant time dt h. And so the dt omega. What? <laughs> what is going on? There is a question or something? Oh, uh... <laughs> That's surprising. <laughs> and so when you look at this, uh, you can uh, relate theta of h to omega of h that you can see. But you have an additional term because here theta normally, it, it can be written h of h omega. And so S of H normally is a nice function, and on, the only problems come from omega, because omega is fixed to the maximum value of the number of pores. And this uh, omega, of course, you have a dt omega, which is proportional to dt H, uh, which gives this, and you have dt omega. Which contain the term depending on sigma, and that's where the uh, the thing are improving, because this term of dt omega it's zero when h has reached the saturated value of h, but this term continues to increase, because in fact when you want to find sigma in terms of p. Of course, that is an elliptic equation. So you have, uh, more precisely, epsilon is equal to, to kt of p, delta ij, 
because you invert this problem. So if you have this, B, I recall to you, uh, it's rho G H plus, uh, no, it's uh, rho H plus rho G Z. Uh, no, H plus rho G Z, sorry. When you have this, that means that P is H up to a term which is given. And so that means that when you look at the problem where you have dt of theta of h, which is s of h uh, dt omega plus s prime of h omega dt h, you have here an additional term elliptic in DTH. So, in fact, the previous uh, Darcy, um, uh, porous medium equation, which is here, which was degenerate because everyone thought that this term was zero when H was constant as well as this one, in fact, is not zero because of this additional term coming from the, uh, from the elliptic equation of the behavior of the material. And so, the uh, degenerate porous medium equation becomes a non-degenerate parabolic problem. It's every code uh, will solve that uh, directly. So that was the thing I wanted to, to show, is that you have one technique, which is a very, very tricky technique. This very tricky uh, technique corresponds to uh, uh, an artificial viscosity that you add to the problem. But this artificial viscosity that you add to the problem has a physical meaning and comes from the behavior of the material. And in fact, Christophe Lepotier, when he did his numerical experiments and results, he added an artificial viscosity, a pseudo viscosity, which was related to the de uh, de deformation of the medium. And he said that the good way of choosing the artificial viscosity was this one. And of course, I was intrigued, and he told me, but that's the behavior of the material. And then uh, we did that and observed that that was really when you couple the behavior of the porous media equation, which need to have an accretive operator and to get a set of all possible solutions, because when you have a function which is on a saturated zone, uh, you, you can change the value of the function at any time. When you couple this with the behavior of the material, you have a much more regular problem and existence and uniqueness of the solution of the coupled problem. So that is the first uh, thing I wanted to, uh, to present as a problem where you have a coupled model and coup coupling models instead of coupling codes. But, but it's, it's not too much characteristic of that. The second theme I want to describe, uh, so if you allow me till 10, uh, is it okay? It will be one hour and uh, 15 minutes. Do you agree? The second model, I will begin by a, a small cartoon. And uh, I like this, it's funny and uh, so, this is trees and two buildings uh, in one place which is situated where Osiris was in the past. And you have two buildings. One of them, let's say, is the Neutronics building. The other one is the Thermohydraulics building. And both buildings have been, uh, have been working, one of them since 50 years, the other one since 30 years, on very accurate and precise numerical codes for solving two different problems. But these two different problems, in fact, uh, let's say 25 years ago, people realized that the two different problems were interacting and could not be solved separately 
had to be sold iteratively. And generally, when I describe that outside, I said that there is a building of neutronics. So the neutronics computed, computes something which is called phi. Uh, and to simplify, phi is the density of neutrons in the nuclear core. And once they have done this very precise computation, there is a, 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 an intern which takes, this, is, this was 25 years ago for uh, saying that, which takes the list of data and just climbs down the stairs, crosses the uh, courtyard, and climbs up the other stairs to give the list of datum of the uh, density uh, on a file or on a paper that was uh, 25 or 30 years ago that was still papers with data to the uh, thermohydraulics building. And these thermohydraulics buildings uh, uses that as um, uh, boundary data. That means the density of neutrons gives you the transfer of heat, and this transfer of heat is a source term for the equations for the neutronics. Uh, for, the, for the hydrodynamics. And the hydrodynamics and thermics gives you a, a pattern of temperature in the fluid, or rather, a pattern of enthalpy. And after they run their computation, they give back the pattern of enthalpy as a function of space, and another intern from the, from the other building gets down the stairs, crosses the courtyard, gets up, and gives the pattern of uh, enthalpy or temperature to the neutronics building. And the neutronics building just has an equation uh, which writes like that, d phi over dz plus sigma a of z phi is equal to a new sigma f of h over k efficient phi, where the quantities d of z, sigma a of z, and sigma f of z, which will be, I suppose, described more precisely by Francois in his talk. Uh, when are you talking? Uh, Friday? Friday morning. Uh, will we describe? It's a diffusion constant for a problem which is an approximation of the transport of neutrons. This is an absorption uh, function which describes how many neutrons are absorbed in every position of the problem. And this is a fission constant, which gives how many neutrons are produced. And in fact, the idea, of course, uh, when a nuclear core wants to work correctly, is that you have as many neutrons as absorbed as product. So you want to have a problem where Kf is the closest you want from one. And so they did. Yes, Olga? I, I ask. Uh, yes, I ask for uh, 10 tell. Uh, nobody complained, so I can do 10 minutes, no problem. No, no, no problem. <laughs> but you should have told me at. The... Okay, so. Uh, the closest of Kf being 1 is this. So, this d of z is computed using the function f of g, which is the enthalpy in every point of the domain. I take z as 1d uh, following my uh, previous argument. But in reality, the problem is not these two ones, but is a problem which is coupled. So that means, of course, you see how it's coupled by this small idea of someone climbing up and down. And the real problem is this one. d over dz of d of h d phi over dz plus sigma a of h phi is equal to new sigma f over k f phi, where sigma f also depends on h, phi of 0 is equal to phi of l is equal to 0. That means that you do not have neutrons which go outside the domain. Uh, and h prime 
it's a simplification, is equal to C phi. And H prime of a, it's dH over dz when you want to find a stationary solution. And you have also, you know that the enthalpy of the temperature and on one side of the problem, which is zero, is the entrance enthalpy. And H of L is equal to HS given. And you have also additional conditions, which are phi positive. And the integral from 0 to L of phi dz is equal to 1. Why these two conditions are relevant? Is that the first one, it's because you could not have a, a negative density of neutrons. And the second one, it's a, a, a probability density. So, of course, the integral is. So that gives you exactly C. C is necessarily equal to the fact that when you integrate from 0 to L, you find Hs minus H. And so now, instead of having two coupled problems, you have only one system of ODEs in this case. And uh, in the last five minutes, I will describe the way uh, we have to compute the solution. And I will say the unique solution of this problem with a much more uh, a regular problem. In fact, we resume to the finding of Kf as a solution of an equation. Not an ODE, nothing uh, and, uh, more, an equation. So, to simplify, D of H is equal to D, sigma A of H is equal, uh, no, sigma of H is given. And I will solve the uh, system of ODEs. Of course, you will notice that the system of ODEs it's a system of order three. You have two derivatives on the first equation, one derivative on the second one, and you have four conditions. So that's too much. So that means that the value of Kf is determined by this problem. When you look at that from, a, uh, from only the Newtonic point of view, Kf is considered as an eigenvalue of uh, an, an, an operator. And so you have infinitely many of them. When you look at the coupled problem, Kf is unique. So I put one over Kf to simplify the notation is equal to lambda. And I will solve the equation. It will be two equations. So minus d over dz of uh, d of h d square h of a dz square, so I assume d, because I replace phi by 1 over c dh over dz, plus sigma a of h dh over dz is equal to lambda nu sigma f of h dh over dz. So that's a totally integrable equation because everything is a derivative. So uh, I will not sigma tilde a of h such that uh, sigma tilde a prime is equal to sigma a. Nu sigma f tilde a prime of h is equal to nu sigma f of h. And so I get integrating minus d h second. I forget it's d over dz plus sigma tilde a of h is equal to lambda nu sigma tilde f of h plus the first constant of integration. I multiply by h prime plus sigma tilde a of h h prime is equal to lambda nu sigma tilde f of h h prime plus sigma zero h prime Fine, we can integrate again. 
and we can integrate again, do it, minus d h prime square over 2, plus something that I will call by commodity u of h, is equal to lambda v of h, plus sigma 0 h, plus sigma 1, uh, c 0 1 h plus c 1. I did two integrations of exact integrable functions. I have two constants of integration, and you can guess that these two constants of integration will be given by h of 0 and h of l. So, and in fact, you deal with all the things so that h0 and h of l gives c0 is equal to c1 is equal to 0. And now I have the ODE h prime is equal to uh, 2 over two, uh, square root of d, sorry, uh, yes, square root of d over square root of 2 uh, u of h minus lambda v of h. So that is the ODE. We resume to an ODE of or the one with a parameter. And finally, I will give the equation that you have to solve. The equation that you have to solve, it's integral of, uh, L is equal to the integral from HE to HS of square root of D over square root of 2 U of H minus U lambda V of H DH. So everything is given here except lambda. Lambda is solution of this equation. You have a unique lambda solution of this equation. Once you have this unique lambda solution of this equation, you solve the equation, and then you, uh, you have an exact solution of the, all the coupled problems. Why did we suppress the fact that we could have infinitely many eigenvalues to the problem up there? It's because hidden there is the hypothesis that uh, h prime is always positive and does not vanish, which is uh, phi positive. And so, uh, in fact, this gives a unique solution of the problem with phi positive. And you resume with this, uh, with this equation. And uh, why in Montreal this year, Francois Dubois just gave a method, a numerical method that can be used directly using a Kronk-Nichol scheme to solve this equation. And after that, uh, if you are interested, you have plenty of small models using special functions that will give analytic solutions of this problem and an analytic value of lambda. And so once you have an analytic value of lambda, you can do uncertainty analysis. So I will stop there, uh, and I will thank you for all for your attention and thank you for all Gav, Virginie, Tommaso, uh, Fabio and so on to, for the uh, proposal of giving a talk and that's uh, so nice to give a talk with real figures be behind you and uh, with a shock and uh, something like that. And thank you for all uh, the organizers, also for the organization. It's lots Thanks of a lot, Olivier. Thanks a lot for the nice talk.